passage is Matthew 18, 1 through 6. All right, I'll begin. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Amen. So now Pastor William will give the message. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let's see here. The title of today's message is Like This Child, Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 6. Let's read our key verse, which is actually verse 4 today, together with one voice. Okay, let's go. Whoever homes themselves like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Um, I want to say, I want to start by saying that I have good news for all of us this morning. You guys, amen. <laughs> Does everyone want to have some good news? Yes, yes amen. The good news that, uh, that I want to share this morning is that God, the holy God, is transforming us into citizens of his great kingdom. What is God doing in all of our lives? He's transforming us. He's changing us into citizens of his kingdom. And he's not just doing this in an uh, iterative way. He's doing this in a transformative way. Uh, iteration versus transformation. Does anyone know what the difference is between iteration versus transformation? Iteration is uh, kind of like the, uh, the 73 years of iteration that the Ford uh, F-150 went through. Little change here, little change there, little like uh, add, a, add a, a little bit more height, make it a little shorter, sometimes a little bit longer. The Ford F-150 went through uh, lots of years of iteration to become uh, the, the F-150 of today. But fundamentally, this, uh, we can't really say that this Ford F-150 was transformed because still, despite all the iterations, it still uses gasoline. It still carries, you know, roughly about three people. It still uses roads to get around. It still has four wheels as well. So despite the fact that uh, the F-150 has been iterated over and over and over for almost uh, 75 years, it's still the same truck. But what God is doing in all of our lives is a radical, not iteration, but a radical transformation. So uh, if I was to say to you that this is the new F-150, you might say, oh my gosh, that is a complete transformation. It doesn't use roads anymore. There's no gasoline in that thing. And it carries not just three to five people, but maybe even hundreds of people. It's completely different, even at the fundamental principle way. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 6, we're going to see how Jesus is not trying to iterate on us, but fundamentally, from the principal level, to totally transform us into his heavenly citizens. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you so much for blessing us with this time that we can uh, come to Jesus through the words of God. Thank you so much for your powerful work in our lives to really transform us into uh, your people. Uh, may you bless us to see this glory uh, that Jesus is doing, that he's done through the cross 
and through his resurrection. We thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin by looking at verses uh, 1 to 3. Let's read these verses responsibly. Actually, this time I'm going to read these for us. I'll read them for us. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 1 says that, uh, discusses the disciples' question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We discussed this last week. Uh, last week, very briefly, I mentioned uh, the idea of the, the port of entry in San Diego and how there was uh, two bugs that were found and how this pertained to the two questions found in Matthew chapter 18. The first question from the disciples is, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And the second one is, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? The disciples were growing as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. They were on the way to entering the kingdom of heaven as Jesus' disciples. However, they were carrying two fundamental issues that did not fit into the kingdom of heaven. We explored the fact that the kingdoms of this earth are focused on a kind of pyramid structure where the greatest is at the top and everyone below them uh, lifts them up. And that oftentimes we find ourselves desiring to be at the top of this pyramid so that we can live the most self-centric life that we've been taught. We also uh, learned that the, uh, the Pharisees were, uh, in a lot of ways, really propagating this perspective and this, this attitude. But that Jesus' teaching, specifically the ones that come from today's passage, teaches us and frees us from self-centeredness. And that is definitely seen most vividly and clearly in the cross of Christ. So that was, chap that was uh, last week, which really covered verse 1. So let's look at verse 2. Now we get to see how did Jesus answer their really uh, difficult but sort of uh, worldly-viewed question. Let's uh, read verse 2 together with one voice. Okay, let's go. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. And calling to him a child, he put that him in the midst of them. Jesus answered their question by creating a visual aid. I love visual aids. That's why <laughs> I, uh, I put so many pictures in my message. Actually, um, if it's okay, Andrew... Can we uh, use you and your son as, <laughs> as a visual aid? Is it okay? Yeah. He's okay? Okay, all right. Well, that's okay. I, I have a backup. <laughs> when we look at the disciples, they were adult men. Some of them were older. Some of them were a little bit younger. But fundamentally, they were all grown men. And Jesus, to create a visual aid, took a child and put, that, put the child in their midst. This is a, you know, a very shocking and very uh, important visual aid. Their question was, who is the greatest? Is it Peter who knows how to give the most powerful messages? Or is it John who is the most insightful Bible student? Who is the greatest? And Jesus instead put a child in their midst, which was probably not what they were expecting Jesus to do. And then said that this child is the greatest. But what are the differences between a grown adult and a little child? I think that if we look at just the visual aid that Jesus gives us, we see two very clear points. One is, that an adult is a lot stronger than a child. An adult is a lot stronger than a child, especially uh, burly fishermen disciples with big muscles and nice uh, uh, quads for lifting up fishnets, strong backs, right? The child, the child, had, the child had no, Probably uh, the total muscle in the child was, was maybe like uh, one arm for the disciples. 
The second thing we know that from just comparing an adult to a child is um, the wisdom of an adult. An adult knows lots of stuff, but a child is, you know, so foolish, you know? Not foolish in a, in a, in a, in a bad way, but, but foolish in a way that they don't know much. So look at this. Let's look at verse 2 again. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. This is how Jesus answered their question. He put a child who's so weak and so foolish, who's so dependent on a parent in their midst, and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is how Jesus answered their question, who is the greatest? Later on, he's going he's gonna to say that the greatest is a child uh, in verse 4. But before getting to that point, he said here in verse 3, truly. Truly here is, is uh, the same word, amen. Right? Amen means like, let it be, or surely, or absolutely. Truly. Jesus, what he's about to say here is 100% reliable, 100% absolutely true. Truly. He says, I say to you, unless you turn, unless you turn. Here the word uh, turn in the Greek uh, can also be uh, translated reverse, undo, untie. Jesus told his disciples, I say to you, unless you turn, change, reverse, you know, like reverse your car, go backwards and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you, but uh, I find that reversing or turning anything is hard. Why is turning hard? You know, when you drive a car, you're supposed to look forward and drive the car forward. But sometimes when you make a wrong turn, you find yourself at a dead end and you realize, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> I got to turn around. And if the street's narrow, you have to, you know, turn around, put your hand around the seat and then reverse backwards. Go the way that you came. I also have a picture of some boots here. I like boots, but one of the things about boots, I hate about boots is that once you tie them up, you're set. And then sometimes I tie them up and then I forget something where I have to take off my, my boots again. And then I have to untie them and then, oh my gosh, does it annoy me. Undoing anything that we've learned, that we've done, decisions that we've made, the person that we've become, to reverse that, to undo that, to scrap it, is very hard. You may have heard of this idea of a sunk cost fallacy. This is the, uh, the thing that our mind does. Our mind plays tricks on us, which is that if you invest in something just a little bit and it doesn't turn out, it's hard to stop investing in it. In fact, you instead of reversing and backing out of a bad decision, if we spent any time on it, we have a tendency to keep pouring more money or energy or time into even something that it is not turning out. It's called a uh, sunk cost fallacy. There was a man who uh, bought a house and he built a, a, he wanted to build a fancy house for his family, but then it, it didn't work out. And so it was a really big fancy house and then he had some financing problems and then his kids kept on growing up while he was trying to build this house. But he didn't give up. And so he sacrificed his marriage and his kids grew up. And then the rooms that he had designed and made for them and that he was going to build for them, they didn't even need anymore. And the guy never gave up until finally one day he kind of finished it, only to have the housing market crash and lost tens of millions of dollars. Now, we might not have that kind of situation in our lives, but for us, uh, it's definitely the case 
that we spent a lot of time working on our lives. The disciples had done this. But Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, unless you turn, reverse, and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Become like children. There's a lot of good things about children. We love children. But I think that the most important things, especially in view of who Jesus is, the reason why children are so important to Jesus' uh, example here is that children are indeed very weak and very foolish. They don't know anything, and they're not strong. They don't have wills to impose their ways. They don't even have a life that they can pick up and move around and do whatever they want. They're very weak and they're very foolish. They don't know a lot. But the amazing thing about children is that despite the fact that they're weak and foolish, they have something amazing. They have a father in heaven, a very strong, a very wise father in heaven. And this Father in heaven, in his great love for his children, sends down from heaven amazing strength and profound wisdom to his children. This is why Jesus wanted his disciples to become like little children. Because in their own strength and in their own wisdom, they were actually weak and foolish. So Jesus encourages them to turn and become weak and foolish so that they can become strong and wise. This is one of those biblical paradoxes. Jesus, speaking to this in, uh, an, uh, later in Matthew, said, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. The will of our Heavenly Father is to send His wisdom to open the eyes of His children for those who become like little children and turn from their own strength and their own wisdom. This provision from our Father in Heaven is for us. So I think that this passage, in a lot of ways, reveals uh, what is our real problem. It's easy in life to think that my problem is I don't have X, Y, or Z. Or my problem is this person or that person. Or my problem is something uh, physical. But what is, the, what is our real problem? What is my problem? real, real, fundamental, at the principal layer. What is my real problem? It's that I'm too strong and that I'm too wise for my own good. So Jesus, knowing that his disciples, just, there was so much strength and, and worldly wisdom in their question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? It doesn't look on the surface like it's that big of a question, but in it is so much strength, so much worldly wisdom behind that question. And so Jesus, knowing them, knowing me, knowing us, said, become like children, so weak, so foolish, but yet so strong and wise because of our Heavenly Father. So Jesus says, though, that this idea, this transformation is not just a, you know, a feel-good message. It feels good. It feels like it's amazing. Like, if I become weak, then I can become strong. If I become foolish, then I can become wise. It, that is good, 
But it's much more than just a kind of suggestion or like that'd be kind of cool. It is a requisite. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven without this transformation. Why then is this transformation such a blocker to entering the kingdom of heaven? Why is it a requirement? Uh, if you can uh, uh, bear with me, I want to get a little bit abstract for a second. Here we have two patterns, two very different patterns. On the, on the left, let's say that the one on the left is uh, uh, the pattern of pride. And on the right, the pattern of humility. The pattern of pride doesn't match with the pattern of humility. These patterns have nothing to do with each other. They don't fit in any way, shape, or form. They're totally different. One is a pattern of sharp triangles. Another one is an is a interesting pattern of repeating squares that spiral into this fractal beauty. When Jesus came, when he made the, the triumphal entry, maybe, uh, you know, humanly speaking, the, his most triumphal moment, humanly speaking, what does it say about him here? It says that this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, Say to, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. This is Jesus' triumphal entry, the moment where there should have been a, a band playing and soldiers, you know, marching and clanking. And Jesus on a giant white war horse. But that doesn't fit in the kingdom of heaven. That kind of strength, that kind of wisdom to do shock and awe on people doesn't fit into the kingdom of heaven. What fits into the kingdom of heaven is meekness and humility, brokenness, and being approachable. And so Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I don't know about you, but I'm on board. Let's do it. How can we become like children? I'm open-minded. Let's, let's see. Let's look at verse 4. Let's read verse 4 together. Okay, let's go. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We have a perfect direction. To become like little children means to simply humble ourselves. I think we could uh, say that the turning we saw in the, in the earlier verse is the same with humbling ourselves. Humbling ourselves. Now, humbling ourselves is a very personal thing. I thought to myself, okay, I, at this part of the message, I probably need to give some examples. Uh, but I thought to myself, well, what about people help me out? <laughs> what could be an example like a situation where we could humble ourselves. I have a couple in my back pocket, but can anyone help me out? Waiting in line at the grocery store? I like that. In what sense, though? Amen. Letting people go ahead of us. So good. Thank you, Andrew. Let's, sit, let's just <laughs> sit on that for a second. Letting other people go in front of us. That's a very beautiful thing. To consider others better than ourselves. To humble ourselves. To come down. Listening. Listening. 
Thank you. Yes, listening to to others. <laughs> Nobody has a problem listening to God. I'll listen to God any day. <laughs> but listening to others. I think sometimes really listening. You know, some people call this uh, active listening, but it's like, I, I don't know, okay, full confession. Most of the time when I'm listening to other people, I'm kind of like loading my reply. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like yeah yeah and then like I'm kind of like putting I'm uh, arming myself for my reply so I can fire back <laughs> but that's wrong I need to humble myself just turn it all off and then really listen to somebody any other examples by the way thank you so far <laughs> oh apologizing thank you Maury yes that one's a big one. Oh. Uh, obeying a bad manager. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Submit, submitting. Submitting to authority. Right? Yeah. I think both of those are really good examples, too. Apologizing. You know, apologizing... I, I have to say, I think that that one is, is massive. Talk about reversing. Talk about, you know, stopping the car. You know, you're going one direction, and then you literally have to you stop the car, you put it in reverse, and then you go the other way, and you apologize. Wow. All of these things is what it means to humble ourselves. And when we humble ourselves, we're abandoning our strength, our human strength. To apologize to somebody is to abandon all human strength. And then to submit to uh, even bad managers, to submit to uh, earthly authorities, that's foolish. When you have a, when you have a, a bad uh, authority, you're supposed to do one of two things, either uh, rebel against them or pack up your bags and leave, not stay under it. That's foolish. These are all wonderful examples. Thank you. I thank God that that worked out. <laughs> but overall, once again, to bring it back to the little children, we go from being strong to being weak from being wise to being foolish. I wanna, I wanna uh, share something personal with you guys. So as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about how God has helped me to become weak. <laughs> this is, I hope this uh, is at least somewhat entertaining. So when I was a, a young Bible student, I was uh, you know, trained to give messages and I had in my mind especially when I started reading about church history, I had in my mind that I wanted to be a preacher like Billy Sunday. <laughs> you know, Billy Sunday was like an active preacher. <laughs> he was like the Elvis of preachers. <laughs> you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to like be so dramatic and whew, just wrench people and... Oh, and then people fall down. <laughs> or at the, if not Billy Sunday, then I want, I also had in my heart to be like Charles Finney. You know, Charles Finney was such a serious preacher. His, uh, his wife, I read, uh, when I read about Charles Finney, just so you, if you don't know, he's the, um, probably the most predominant uh, preacher in the uh, Second Great Awakening in America. His wife said about him, uh, honey, I love you, but when I see you standing there and preaching, it reminds me of a powerful angel of the Lord about to swing his mighty sword and slay people. <laughs> I thought, that's so cool. I dreamed of the day that my wife might say that to me. <laughs> or George Whitfield. You know, he also was a very dramatic preacher. He kind of like uh, pioneered the 
Billy Sunday style. This was the kind of strength that I had in my heart about my Christian life. You know, it's kind of a, a, a funny thing I wanted to share, but also at the same time, it just showed how I had the wrong concept. Because the thing that God showed me is this. This cross full of weakness and foolishness. This cross that was so different than the way and the image that I had in my mind and heart of being a Christian. But I found in this cross of Christ that this is weak, but it's actually so strong. And it's so foolish, but it's so wise. And I became, and I'm being, um, becoming more and more persuaded that this way of the cross is the real way to live my Christian life. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So what is the outcome of this, of this weakness and foolishness? Let's look at verses 5 to 6. Let's read these verses responsibly. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Verse 5 shows us that whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. This is very interesting because I think um, there's one thing that children do so well, and I've seen this so many times. You put two kids about the same age in the same proximity. They don't know each other. Very quickly, they just sort of like, like magnets or like dr are drawn to each other, and then they go, hi. <laughs> And what I like about kids is they don't even say, hi, what's your name? I mean, some do, but most of the time they go, hi, you want to play? <laughs> and <laughs> when we humble ourselves and become like little children, a beautiful thing happens that we've seen uh, several places in Matthew's gospel, this word receive. We start receiving people. And we even receive other people that aren't fancy or aren't powerful or wise, but also other people that are even like children. You know, in, in the book of James, if you remember, we saw that the people uh, that James was writing to, they were very receptive to powerful, rich people. They gave them the best seats in the church. But then the poor people, the people that weren't of any kind of earthly status, they were given seats on the floor, or, you know, some kind of um, bad place. But when we humble ourselves like little children, we don't make that mistake. Instead, we can very naturally receive people and welcome them. Um, I want to share a, kind of a funny story, but it kind of is somewhat pertinent. So. Uh, David Park and I, we went to Chicago the last couple days and to a, um, a leaders meeting, you know, UBF leaders meeting. And, uh, you know, a couple people uh, know me by first name, but a lot of people don't, which is fine. And uh, I was there and I was sitting at a table with a bunch of people who didn't know me and I had a hat on. It was uh, my favorite hat. It's my favorite green, green uh, uh, Ruka hat. And I was, I was sitting there, and I was sitting next to a nice um, uh, you know, missionary woman, and, and she's like, oh, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm, uh, I'm William. And then she's like, oh, what chapter are you from? I'm from LA, UBF, and oh, great to see you, nice to meet you. And then somebody says to her, oh, this is the new uh, director of LA, UBF. <laughs> and she goes, what? <laughs> She says to me, you're wearing a hat. I would have thought that a uh, director of such a chapter like LAUBF would be wearing you know, a nice, uh, <laughs> nice suit. 
I said, nope, it's just me. <laughs> I think, though, that um, it's, it's okay, you know. But I did, I did take a moment of consideration there that sometimes it's easy to have the mindset of greatness and how somebody looks or where they've been educated or what they've accomplished in life and use that as some kind of metric to receive them or to not receive them. But when we become like little children, so humble like Jesus, then we naturally just receive everyone. It's very beautiful. And the amazing thing is, here, check it out. When we receive other people in this humble way, wow, we receive Jesus. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. What a secret. What a blessing. Now, verse 6 kind of ends on a very uh, strong note. So let's dig this out real fast and we'll be done. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fast around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, we talked today about the two kinds of patterns, the pattern of pride, the pattern of strength and worldly wisdom, and then the pattern of uh, weakness uh, and the pattern of foolishness. When Christians, and I think depending on, on your level of, you know, how many people might be influenced by you, it, it matters, it kind of scales, this verse 6 can scale to different levels. If we hold to the pattern of the past, the pattern of pride, the pattern of strength and, and wisdom, worldly wisdom, we end up causing other people to be stumbled by us. You know, causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. You remember several weeks ago we talked about that word, uh, scandalizo? This is the same, that same word is, is in here, cause, cause to sin, stumble somebody like tweak them, mess them up. When, when, peop, when Christians show a pattern of pride, they end up having little ones that are influenced by them to receive that pattern of pride. And then they grow up and become proud people too. Strong disciples. Worldly wisdom disciples. Jesus saying, uh, actually mentioned this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 15, which I recommend to kind of read as like a background for this passage, but he's, I'll just read verse 15. Talking to the Pharisees, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You see, when the Pharisees had the old pattern of strength and worldly wisdom, the people that were influenced by them, the little ones, took on that pattern. And they became just like them. And that pattern was propagated to more people. And it actually created people, disciples, or proselytes, that's another word for disciple, that were twice as much a child of hell as themselves. This is a shocking uh, realization of how this pattern spreads to people. So Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me, whoever stumbles them, causes them to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fast around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. You know, millstones, this is a millstone. It's this big stone <laughs> with a circle. And I think in our minds, we maybe have two pictures about what it, you know, Jesus is very vivid here. You know, I... I kind of think it's more like the one on the left, you know, like a millstone fastened around your neck. I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's your works, your influence, what you did to other people gets put around your neck and have to bear the responsibility for the influence. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. So let's not do that. Let's become like little children and avoid all that mess. So in conclusion, 
we learn today that Jesus has good news for us. We are being transformed into citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And how is he doing that? Jesus, our Lord, is teaching us to become weak and to become fools, to embrace the way of the cross, which is weakness and foolishness, but is actually strength and wisdom. May God bless us to uh, meditate on this passage continually so that our hearts can receive this really important seed deep inside and in its right time to bear wonderful, beautiful fruit. Let's read the key verse together. Okay, let's go. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. One word, like this child. Let's pray. Father in heaven, um, thank you so much for blessing us with this time uh, that we could really just uh, see the beauty of becoming weak and becoming fools. Lord, we're so strong and we're so wise, but we realize that this actually is the wrong pattern that doesn't fit into the kingdom of heaven. Um, help us to really take on Jesus' pattern of weakness and foolishness, the way of the cross, so that we can become strong and truly wise. Um, bless us to really meditate on these beautiful passages and may this cross of Christ uh, be in our hearts always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.